I really wanted to build the best tool that is possible for creating a blockchain. I think we're seeing a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of like cool projects, mm -hmm. a lot of open, a lot of openness. Yeah. Um, a general assumption that if you come to this space, then you develop open source, you, uh, you develop in the open, you really sort of search in the open, you, coll you, you, you know, collaborate, um, you do cool events like these, and uh, you know, in general, um, you know, you're all working towards roughly the same goal. And I think as time goes on, as the the easy money goes away and the more difficult money starts to uh, swamp the space, then we're going to have um, a sort of different um, different forces pulling in the space. Okay, we'll get to the forces in a sec. So let's let's start with the positive note for a bit. Um, what's the, the one thing that you're most excited about in terms of development in blockchain, and how has that changed over the last say six or twelve months? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's um, there are a few interesting currents, definitely. You know, and I, I think you know, you talk to a lot of people, and they'll start saying things like scalability, and it's like, yeah, sure, it's, it's kind of an interesting technical problem. Yeah. Um, I think um, I think governance is the sort of the single um, uh, point of focus for me at the moment, um, and I think you know when you start realizing that these things, these economic systems that we're building have such, uh, you know, such, such magnitude, such power uh, taken as a whole, then the idea of governance is you know, really quite um, interesting. So you, you talked about forces, so let's, uh, there's a lot of positive things, people have been relatively quiet, but there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. Um, lots of experimentation, you talked about sharding, you talked about a lot of these things, but let's so let's let's talk about those forces and maybe the maybe the forces that are going to require more bravery and might not be so positive. So what what are the what are those forces as you see them? Um, well, you know, people do things for for a reason, right? So you know, some of us are working towards um, some sort of vision. Some of us are working towards personal goals. Some of us are working towards I don't know making themselves money. Um, Different people really do have different goals. And I think in the early days, um, the goals were like fairly ideological. And I think as time has gone on, there's been some dilution uh, within the space. Um, and, I, you know, you look around the space at the moment, and it's, it's definitely evolving. And I see kind of something a little bit similar in the 90s computer games, you know, video games. Like in the early days, you wrote a video game just because it was, it was like a form of art. You did it because you loved doing yeah. it. You had a vision of what you wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, you set about to uh, try to achieve it. Towards the end, it became very kind of almost factory oriented. People put significant amounts of cash in, teams were big, the amounts of assets that you had to um, author became uh, huge. And uh, before long, it was really more of a business than an art form. It, it did that transition. Yeah. And I think when we look at golden ages, we look at the bit sort of right before the knee, right before it switches from art to business. And it's still art, but when you know, people have really started to master the art. Yeah. And I think that's really the area that we're at. And I think the same forces that, that applied in the 90s with video games, you know, as the big factory kind of games yeah. producers came along, I think those uh, were, slow, were slowly heading towards those times. So, so one of the underlying causes, both with gaming and with just business, is funding and the sources of funding and what comes as either intended or unintended consequences of that. So can you speak to, to us a little bit about funding and what that will logically end up uh, resulting in? Um, I think as, as the source of funds becomes maybe a little bit more, a little bit more focused on profit making rather than anything more sort of visionary, yeah. then the, the sorts of um, decisions that the leaders of projects need to take will become um, less ideological and more, um, uh, more governed by very simple tactical 
um, requirements. And what this ultimately means is that we're going to see um, as projects become increasingly desperate to turn a profit or to create their market cap, yeah, make it as big as possible, which sort of means the same thing, we're going to see projects taking increasingly desperate steps in order to defend their territory. Such as? Well, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ways of doing this, but basically delivering stuff is difficult, right? It's really hard to build stuff. It's really easy to promise stuff. It's quite easy to have ideas, but it's really difficult to produce stuff. And as people realize that a lot of projects promise a lot, but aren't really delivering all that much, then we're going to end up with those projects needing, of course, to eventually deliver some sort of profit for their investors. We're going to end up with a sort of a mix of um, the kind of dark arts of communication and delivering at least a little bit of what they said. But wait a minute, the dark arts of communication, that's like an age old tradition in the valley, right? You know, like that's kind of the deal. You know, over promise and then eventually you deliver? Eventually delivering your promises is fair enough, but it may be that some of these promises are impossible to deliver. Okay, and a little bit of the zero sum game mentality, I think you're, you're talking. So investors will consolidate around one or two winner take all type of mentality. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, in the early days with the spirit of collaboration in the space, it really wasn't a winner takes all thing, right? It was, it was like we're all working together. We, yeah. the, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. Sort of yeah. a, a thing. These days, I think with the um, VC mentality increasingly calling the shots behind project leadership, yeah. um, it really will be, um, there's going to be a phase of consolidation coming inevitably, and uh, that's going to leave probably a monopoly, a duopoly, or whatever, but it's going to basically take out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the horses and turn them into losers. And that's really unfortunate in, in the sense of the mentality behind what project leaders are, because if they believe there's going to be a winner-takes-all kind of situation, then it sort of, um, the, the kind of tactics that they're going to employ are going to be necessarily more desperate. So let me get this straight. So there's going to be funding which will be implicitly bring winner-take-all mentality. There's going to be a movement towards more dark arts alongside delivery of the miracles. And then there's going to be essentially chaos. And I, more. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? I'm saying indeed, yeah. I think there's, um, there is every chance that uh, projects are going to start, going to increasingly stop looking at each other as, um, as, as cooperative partners in building a sort of shared vision. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, at least without like additional developments, they're going to increasingly look at each other um, with suspicion as like uh, competitors. So you talked about governance as the thing that is most occupying or at least energizing you in terms of getting it right vis-a-vis -vis polka dot. And, uh, can, can you just describe and connect the dots for us between your view of what we just described, both positive and maybe not so positive, and how that's shaping your view for what governance uh, ought to look like and perhaps the, the various paths for governance that you have and or have thought about? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, um, I, I think, you know, governance has a number of, uh, there's a number of reasons that you want to introduce governance, both roughly splitting them up into internal and external reasons, right? So internal reasons are for things like, you know, fixing stuff that went wrong, yep. that everyone can see went wrong, and, and sort of making everything right again. Um, creating, you know, uh, pushing through upgrades, technical upgrades, all the rest of it. So those are, those are sort of the obvious reasons, and the reasons that I think I've been mostly focused on over the last couple of years is the why governance is, is sort of sensible and perhaps even necessary yeah. for these systems. Um, but there are also external reasons. This is something I think that's relatively new. So blockchains mostly have existed basically in isolation, right? They, they are sovereign unto themselves, but if, they, if you want to do anything between chains, then you have to go to like relatively kind of crappy uh, atomic swap mechanisms or yeah. exchanges which are generally centralized. Yeah. and only one for two. So if we instead take a view that there's going to be lots of different chains, at least for a period, then, um, and that they're you know, going to be in fairly sharp competition, potentially, um, then we're going to, then governance starts to make sense in a different way. It starts to make sense in terms of how a blockchain exists externally, like with regard to its peers, sure. the other blockchains out there and whatever else. And 
what governance can allow to happen is for the stakeholders within a chain to come together and make you know, specific decisions or specific statements about the external world. Now, making statements is kind of, you know, whatever, who cares? Making decisions might be a little different as we know blockchains control market caps upwards of you know, billion dollars. Um, decisions made with the backing of a multi-billion dollar economy sure. are uh, necessarily going to be fairly powerful decisions. And therefore the decision making apparatus needs to be accordingly powerful um, and responsible to handle that kind of authority. So, so I, I sit on um, the, the government's committee on the publicly traded board and there's a bunch of rules that we have to follow either by law or by the bylaws of the company. Um, what you're describing feels a little bit like corporate governance in that, in one regard, and on the other hand, it feels a little bit more like nation states. You start talking about multi-billion dollar economic forces. Like, is that fair, or is it gonna shape its, itself one way or the other? How, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, if you go back to the first uh, blockchains, you know, like Bitcoin, the assumption was that this this technology, this system, this economic system, yeah. is, is basically, it's, a, it's minimal, right? Yeah. It's like gold. Um, mm -hmm. Then you go to like um, uh, the, you know sort of Ethereum and certainly the sort of edges of the Ethereum community that are quite that, that can be quite pro governance and it's starting to like we start thinking about upgrade we start thinking about something that's sort of alive a little bit more. Sure. Um, with I think with um, my my assumption for like blockchain economies blockchain systems at the moment is that they're going to be something indeed a little bit like um, corporations where they've got stock and you've got to start kind of think about. The decisions that a, that a blockchain system makes would affect its economy in the same way that a company, the decisions a company or a board of a company makes would affect its stock. But I think you're right with the point of um, nation states. I think ultimately, although there are differences between blockchains and nation states, for example, blockchains don't really have citizens. There's no way to be born into a blockchain. There's no, no armies. No armies. <laughs> no um, but yeah, I mean, there's um, there are no armies at the moment. Okay. <laughs> But in principle, is that, is that why we're here together? Are we recruiting? <laughs> I mean, ultimately, these are these are giant economic systems. If, yeah. they, if they go as far as we think they're going to go, then they're going to need to defend themselves against other giant economic systems. Hmm. That's intriguing. Um, <laughs> so, if you think about what that means for algorithms that come together to govern uh, something uh, like like Polkadot, mm -hmm. parity. Um, what role do you see things like AI and or other tools playing? And how do those two interface? So I look at, like, this is, this is something that comes up fairly often, like, you know, blockchain and AI, how, how they come together. I think, like, they basically exist on opposite ends of the computer science spectrum. Yeah. So AI really deals with data, just data, like, valueless data. It's all about turning data into, basically, information. Yep. Okay. Um, Blockchains are kind of the opposite. They don't really deal with very much data. They can't. They can't get the throughput. But they do deal with value. The data that they do, like like uh, compute, has real strong economic value. Yeah. You can make decisions. Um, this, this is the stuff of decisions. Now, if you combine the two, then basically you've got like the two ends of the spectrum covered. Now. You've got the ability to sort of intelligently make decisions. And now you've got the autonomous ability to make decisions, to have those decisions stick, yeah? to have to put real economic might behind those decisions. Um, now when you've got that, it seems, at least to me, that there's not really any obvious place on the spectrum left for humans to come in and exist. You're getting all Terminator shit on us right here, Kevin. <laughs> I mean, I don't think blockchains or AI alone is going to deliver Skynet, but if you combine the two together, if you basically have machine government, governance, and you also have machine intelligence, then surely that means we're all going to be ruled by smart machines. Okay, let's shift gears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about that for a second. So, uh, what are the things that are uniquely positioned, Polkadot is uniquely positioned to deliver. Um, and if you think specifically about the first N projects, whether that's three, four, five, whatever, um, before the real network effects kick into play, like what, what's, what's in it for, for those projects? Why, why, why Polkadot? Um, I mean, 
we would aim to really see the network effects and create something of a critical mass initially, you know. And this is basically to do with bridges. So yeah. by building bridges, you know, we want to make quite Polkadot, theory, right, so. yeah. um, we want to make Polkadot a hub of existing chains. Yeah. Um, we want to facilitate those chains and talking to each other, and we also want to facilitate um, interacting with those chains from new chains. Sure. Um, I think uh, ultimately the the uh, the value add uh, with Polkadot won't just be network effects, but it will also be tooling. Okay. Right. So building Substrate, we've, like at least I really wanted to build the best tool yeah. that is possible for creating a blockchain. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I could have built Polkadot with my team. I could have built Polkadot just as Polkadot. We could have left it as a repo, like it's its own repository. It is what it is, you can hack on it if you want, but basically it's done. We didn't do that. Specifically took the decision to split Polkadot into Substrate. Now, the point of doing that was basically to say, to, do to force ourselves to dog food, right? To force ourselves to eat our own dog food. Yeah. If we make Substrate good enough to build Polkadot on, then we make it good enough for anyone else to build anything on. That was the ultimate goal. Um, if you had infinite time to do one thing just right now uh, and talk about, what would it be? Uh, infinite time. Yeah, that's a lot of time. <laughs> um, infinite time. I guess, like, uh, I, I guess I'd wait until. Uh, crypto had like caught up with the rest of the world, and we could make uh, like completely zero knowledge, anonymous state, arbitrary state transitions uh, that could scale infinitely. And I build all of that into Polkadot because there must be a mathematical equation somewhere for that. That's a lot of scale. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things that's, that's uh, been really interesting to me is just the, the talent magnet that you guys have been able to attract. Such an amazing. Uh, Talent. Uh, so, and, and I think part of what um, awesome gatherings and conferences like this is, is about exchanging ideas and really hopefully creating a, a broader talent magnet, if you will. Like, how have you thought about that with, with, uh, with Parity and uh, bringing such high and consistently high caliber of people together? I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. I read a book by, uh, uh, edited by a guy called Joel Spills. He's quite well known in the software space. Um, it was actually not written by him as a bunch of essays, but it would have one essay like the 10x, the 10x coder, the 10x dev, or whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. um, this is basically the idea that some coders just produce ridiculous yep. amounts more useful code than others. Yep. Um, and the idea is that these coders tend to like coding around each other. They tend to form critical masses where they just kind of you get a clump of them together and they just all recognize, recognize that this is a clump of. 10x coders and they tend to get attracted to it. Sure. I think we've been lucky enough um, to, uh, to sort of build ourselves as a, as a sort of crystallization point in that regard. Um, but beyond that, I think it's, it's just really important to ensure that um, everyone is focused on, on actually building. Like, yeah. we have like a really uh, important policy in parity um, that's basically like, you know, you, you can't like just sit around and have other people do your work for you. Yeah. The people that, that, that uh, get on the parity are the people that actually take up the work and build stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Talk less, shit more. Right. Um, okay, so Satoshi left a point after the launch. Um, you and many of your uh, co-founders left Ethereum. Um, I'm not sure if you really left the theory. You're We're still in the ecosystem. Let's Our ghost it. still haunts the theory. Okay. Well, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, okay, so well, what's going to happen here? Uh, what's going to happen vis a vis you? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I look at um, Polkadot as a staging ground as much as anything else. Same way. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a place to, um, uh, to create. Yeah? Like, you need a canvas if you're going to. Yeah. If you're going to build something, something big, um, and Polkadot's really, uh, yeah, I guess it's an important piece. It's, it's, it is the, the foundation for a lot of a lot of other projects. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I would hope to be around and uh, creating more stuff than using Polkadot and uh, being one of the people that actually uh, sort of helps uh, make Polkadot's mass uh, critical. Cool.
Um, we're going to shift gears, and we may have time for one or two questions at the end, but uh, we're going to do speed round. So okay. you've, not seen, <laughs> you've not seen these topics, so uh, it's going to fire away. And the goal here is, in one sentence or less, to give an answer or response. Uh, taps or spaces? <laughs> obviously. I, I, I'm not even going to, like, the, the answer is obvious. You don't need a, 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 a specific uh, take point. Taps. <laughs> <laughs> What's your title? Uh, Chief White Space Officer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, substrate. Um, it's it's the Linux uh, for building blockchains. Okay, who's on? Uh, it's going to be crazy. Libra. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Edward Snowden. The man. <laughs> China. Uh, potential. Keto. Uh, works for me. <laughs> Guitar. Uh, the Floyd. The, the Floyd? The Floyd. Oh, there you go. Um, Berlin. Uh, poor but sexy. <laughs> Last but not least, whiskey. Uh, mine will be a Buna Hutton 12, please. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay, well, with that, we have a little bit of time left for, for audience Q&A, so if you guys have some more, if there, um, I see a minor blue screen there, um, <laughs> so I don't think there's questions popping up on the screen, so um, are we going to, do we have roving mics for any audience questions? Um, so earlier you said something about how competition is going to get more fierce in this space and then there's going to eventually be a winner takes all, but you're still building a blockchain that connects other blockchains? Yeah, I, I don't, I am, the winner takes all attitude is definitely not an attitude I think is good for the space. I think there is a chance um, that it will become kind of forced on the space. If you look at other, um, if you look at the progressions of other major developments, particularly in like the cons as, as they turn from um, the initial sort of MVP to consumer, um, you find that these um, you find there's a there's a point of consolidation. So I mentioned video games earlier. There's also like if you look at like the 8-bit computers back in the early 80s, right? They started off like huge numbers of crazy random 8-bit computers with random manufacturers you've never heard of. There were loads of them, loads and loads of them. And then basically they all consolidated initially to, to three, the uh, Spectrum, the Amstrad, and the Commodore. And then for the next series of, of computers, it was just two, it was the Atari ST and the Amiga, which was 16-bit. And then following from that, there was basically just the PC and a little bit the Mac. And that, that, that was, that, the consolidation was huge. And it consolidated and eventually the, the sort of, um, the innovation, I guess, moved to different levels, you had like expansion cards and you had software, but basically it's like consolidation and in some sense winner takes all does seem to be a running theme um, as computer science inventions become mass market. So I do, I do wonder if, you know, the same forces that were at work there will be at work um, in blockchain. And if you look at some of the more recent projects, we are increasingly seeing a tendency towards closed development and closed source. Like, it was unheard of at the beginning. Like, you know, at the beginning it was one and it was open source. Yeah. And within, you know, year following from that, they were basically all just hacks on that and open source. And then there were a few sort of interesting projects, but they were still all open source. People published their research openly. Increasingly now, particularly with heavily VC funded projects, that's not the case. And I, I, I worry that this is you know, an increasing trend. And the thing is, if it is an increasing trend, then the same reasons that these people are sort of closed sourcing and be, you know, becoming a sort of closed shop will be the same, will be the reason that they, you know, look um, as an increasingly sort of um, zero sum game, winner takes all, everyone's a competitor kind of attitude. And that attitude ultimately develops into, you know, very heavy competition. Any more questions? Okay, Gab, do you want to leave the audience with anything we haven't already covered? Um, I, didn't you have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of interesting... I, I seem to remember, you know, 
free chat. We had a few uh, talking points. I think we've covered most of them. Yeah. Right. I think there's, there's a question from the gentleman behind here as well. Uh, what's what role politics in all of that? When you know, if you can actually make modernity in a sense less complicated through these functions for both the blockchain and AI, what happens to politics? Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, so politics, I guess, is um, is the idea of, of taking collective decisions and, and more or less uh, bestowing uh, uh, power, bubbling up power from, in some sense, the authority of the mass of humans towards a uh, you know a, a specific polity of a group of, of, of empowered people. Um, it basically revolves around the idea that a group of people will make the decisions for a bigger group of people. Yeah, yeah? like that, that's politics, right? Now, if, if everyone basically says, um, well, we're not going to, the algorithm for making decisions, the decision making apparatus, won't, will no longer be um, assigning a bunch of people, or in some sense, not, not having a revolution when we decide we don't want these bunch of people um, to be ruling us anymore. Um, instead of doing that, we're going to just basically sign into an algorithm, right? So that basically that means, well, there is no more politics. Like, in, in some sense. I mean, it depends what the algorithm does, I guess. The algorithm could be like a parliamentary algorithm that just, like, cedes its power over to um, individuals, a small collection of individuals. But assuming that it doesn't do that, it does something else. You know, it actually, you know, lives the dream of algorithmic governance, of like some sort of futarchy or whatever. Then, that's, that, there will be no politics. There will just be um, this algorithm that figures out what decisions should be made according to whatever, I don't know, gets oracleized into it and, and, and whatnot. Um, and we will end up with, uh, you know, something, something quite different. Maybe the follow-up is not what happens to the mechanism of politics, which I think you've described well there, but what happens to politics as a, uh, a thing that people do? Does it just wither away or does it fight back? Because uh, and it's sort of big P politics. Maybe that's what I'm trying to get at. So, uh, well, are you saying like, will there be, um, yeah, sort of leader or would be leaders and, and, and uh, potential presidents and prime ministers all sort of coming along and saying, you don't want to, to have this algorithm govern you. You want you want me. Vote me in. I mean, possibly. I guess algorithms can only continue ruling the world um, if they if they have the tacit backing of everyone that uses them. Like, this is the weird thing about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's a piece of software. Um, it used to be the case that if, if a piece of software didn't do what we wanted to do, then we changed it and made it do, do what we wanted to do, right? It was a bug. So, for example, if I had a piece of software that sort of reported to me that my balance was low, I would change the software so it reported to me that my balance was high. Um, back in the day, in the 80s and 90s, we had, you know, there were computer games, but people used to hack computer games so they had infinite lives, you know, so they had infinite health. Like, it was, it was a normal thing to do, to basically alter software so it does more or less what you want it to do, it tells you what you want it to, to say. Um, that's not the case, no one's doing that with Bitcoin. Why? We're running software that is telling us um, stuff that we don't really want to know. Your balance is lower than you would like it to be. Why is it, why am I running this software? And the reason that we're running it is because it's, it's a higher calling. It's not, it's not serving us, it's serving consensus, it's serving everybody, of which I am a small part. So, it, Bitcoin can only work if everyone basically agrees to its rules, right? And it would be the same in principle with this kind of algorithmic governance. We would only, we would, we would go along with it because we sort of tacitly accepted that it was probably the best thing out there. And if a, a critical mass of people decided not to go along with it, then they'd go along with something else, perhaps, like a politician. But I think, um, I think it would be sort of up to the politician to convince people that indeed that would be a better choice. And we would, you know, if we're talking like Doomsday, presumably the algorithm would know that this was a potential competitor to itself and would address it accordingly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't do titles. Um, how are we on time? Are we good? You've got eight minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Gavin, you, did, you and I did discuss a little bit about, so how do you create stability? Maybe, maybe coming from the other end, meaning not the future back, but from the present out. So when you, when you see governance structures that become durable over time, there's instability in the beginning because almost by definition, founders or a small subset of initial um, uh, founders or a group of founding teams have a disproportionate say. 
Um, yeah. how, how do you see overcoming that in a, in a constructive and a smooth way? Um, I mean, I think, I think it's important, you know, projects don't begin with a mass movement. They begin with a crystallizing scene. Most of the time you can sort of say, yeah, look, um, there was this person or this group yeah, you had a conversation that led to a snowball effect, blah, 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 and eventually we are where we are. Um, I think it's uh, that, that there's a reason for that, right? Like, you, yeah. there has to be some original. Like, I, I don't want to like become a sort of you know intelligent design spokesman or anything, but there does have to be some original sort of um, uh, idea, Vision. right? And there has to be uh, the initial work yeah. done. It's a great idea, and if, if you're not careful, it can uh, the sort of much as like a sort of a, a little candle might get put out by a strong wind. You've got to be careful before you uh, before you can sort of put it the in oxygen the of the wind is really yeah. going to help the small flame. Sure, sure. Um, so how do you turn the, the candle into you know an increasingly larger fire until eventually you've got you know um, whatever whatever is a productive thing that could be like into fire, which I can't think of anything as fire strictly quite destructive, but um, so steam, or steam, steam, engine, steam engine or a giant yeah. steam engine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, An interrupt. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, the first thing is to ensure that there is a, uh, a backup, right? There is something that will allow you um, to guarantee that once, uh, for whatever reason, the initial leadership Initial founders or whatever stopped sort of doing their job very well. Yep. That there is a there is a transitional mechanism um, to move things over. And I think you know uh, it's not too difficult to imagine that for a blockchain. You, know, you can call a fork, or you can um, if you've got governance, then you can sort of vote people or whatever. Now, um, then the question is, you know, is there some way of I guess transitioning? Uh, like forcing or, or, or ensuring that it's not a step change, right? Ensuring that it's not um, uh, initially there's just one, and then eventually there's everybody, and that, that probably is going to be very volatile and, and, and destabilizing. And I think I, I don't know. I, I guess this this sort of depends precisely on the system. Um, ultimately, I think it's important to have uh, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of early um, invite a lot of opinions early on, invite community, invite. Um, others to take on as much responsibility as is possible, and also as is you know, reasonable. You don't want to, you don't want to sort of give um, core important roles to untested, potentially yeah. um, uh, uh, incapable uh, uh, companies, organisations, individuals. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.